I will never forget that moment. It wasn't the last moment, but that moment, it changed everything for me because I finally understood the death and understood that this sexual sin jeopardized my relationship with God, jeopardized my identity, and jeopardized my purpose because I no longer wanted part with these things because of the guilt that I felt. And at that moment, I realized that guilt is nothing to underestimate. Be very careful. Be very, I don't care how much faith that you think you have, how many mission missionary trips that you've had, how many years that you've been a Christian. That guilt is stronger than you. It is stronger than you. You will think that you're in great standing with God and then you fall and that guilt will take you ooh, for a roller coaster, man. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Where do you lose at? I'm, am I missing it? Somebody tell me. Look at you. Uh, uh. <laughs> he will direct your path. So what's there to fear again? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Thank you so much for tuning in once again to the Church Board Confessions podcast. I'm your host, Emanuele Hecke. Um, thank you for taking out this time, this early Monday morning or whenever, whenever time that you're watching this. Um, I hope you guys have had an amazing week leading up to today. And if you haven't, I pray that, you know, things that we talk about in this episode could potentially uplift your spirits. Um, I'm going to get right into it today because I think I have a lot to cover. I just want to be safe. Try to keep this under 30 minutes. Um, so a very interesting topic that we have today, ladies and gentlemen, um, it was inspired by an Ask Church Boy submission. Thank you guys for submitting questions. I really appreciate that topic suggestions, all that different stuff. So like I said, like I, like I would always say, you know, we're going to talk about it. You know, you guys, this is a dialogue, anything that you guys have that you want me to bring up or any questions you have, I'm here. So, um, this Ask Church Boy question came from Sam and Sam, I don't know if you're a boy or girl. I know you wanted to stay anonymous and everything, but you, so you just said Sam. Um, and Sam asked, how um, how do we combat negative thoughts and how do we um, overcome sexual sin? Now, that's two different questions. I'm going to focus on the sexual sin part um, just because I feel like that's a very important topic for our generation and the generations of the past and to come. Um, I will say this, you know, that's not the first time that somebody has brought up this uh this uh topic and ask church boy i'm not gonna lie man I, i've seen the other ones i forgot who they're from but i'm not gonna lie i don't i wasn't ready i wasn't ready to talk about sexual sin back then um because i i would say this like you know how do i explain this i was I, i'm very nervous to talk about stuff like this you know like um, I've actually like done a couple drafts of this recording already. And like, you know, I was very timid and stuff like that. So, um, you know, there's something that I struggled with for years and, you know, I've, I've recently been delivered from it and I thank God for that. And I give God the glory, but I was very hesitant to talk about this just because like, you know, I've never really talked about it publicly. I've talked to my accountability partners about it, my mentors about it, my dad about it, but I haven't really talked to the world about it. And, you know, um, I think that I'm scared of being judged sometimes. I'm, I think that I'm scared of being looked at differently. Um, but at this point, I don't care. And I pray that as I share my story, that it can help you guys. Um, because at the end of the day, what I want you guys to get from this episode is that any voice that is telling you that it's impossible to overcome this is a lie. I want you to know by the end of this episode that it is indeed possible to overcome sexual sin. It is indeed possible to overcome pornography, masturbation, homosexuality, um, adultery, fornication, the urges that you have to have sex outside of marriage or do anything sexual outside of marriage. You are able to overcome it, ladies and gentlemen. You are. Um, and I'm a testament to that because 
like I said, it's the first time, you know, I'm saying this publicly, so bear with me. <laughs> I struggled with uh, pornography and masturbation for years, for years, um, and God has delivered me from it, and he didn't deliver me from it. Um, I'm not saying that because I'm better than you. I'm not saying that because I'm wiser than you. Um, I have fallen into the trap for years, time and time and time and time and time again, but I'm thankful um, through what I'm going to talk about. God has delivered me from it. I'm not better than you. I'm not more, no. This is God. This is God's doing. I could not do it on my own power. I could not do it on my own strength. And I'm going to talk to you guys about this right now. I struggled with it for years, for years. It all started when I was young. I was looking up anime on the computer. I was like probably like I don't know, 11 or 12 looking up anime on the computer. Somehow I ran into naked images. And from there, just took off from naked images to masturbation to pornography and masturbation and so on and so on. And, um, it really peaked in the seventh grade. I vividly remember I was in the classroom and they were teaching us about sex ed and we had this one teacher come up and he said that masturbation was something that you're supposed to do. It's natural, yada, yada, yada. And that was when I peaked because like, oh, it's natural. It's, it's, you know, this is this. And, you know, I peaked. I would always do it all the time. I was kind of addicted to it. And, um, you know, something about, you know, if, if you fell into sexual sin, that feeling after that feeling of guilt, that feeling of being dirty, that feeling of being far from God, that is not fun at all. That is not fun at all. Um, and I was, that that kind of made me slow down after my peak, you know what I'm saying? But it was still something that I would say I was struggling with because I was in that cycle. And you know the cycle that I'm talking about. You know, if, if you're accustomed to this fight with sexual sin, you're good. Everything's good. You know what I'm saying? You're good with God, everything, you know, you're in this path and everything. And then the urge comes, right? And then when the urge comes, you try to fight it off, You try to fight it off, but then you fall into it, right? And then after you fall into it, right after, immediately after you feel so terrible, you just feel so dirty, you feel so far from God. And at some point, thank God, you find, you wound up the courage, you wound up the sense, really, to come back and, you know, ask God for forgiveness and everything. And, you know, it may take some time. It may not take some time sometimes, but, you know, eventually, okay, God forgave you. You've read up on his grace and everything and you feel good again. And then the cycle starts all over the urge falling in forgiveness and so on. And I was in that for years and I was stuck in that. Um, and it got so bad to a point where, I would fear the urge. You know what I'm saying? Like I had lost to this battle so many times that I would just fear the urge. I was in this cycle, you know, where you're good, right? And the thing that, you know, takes you away from that stance would be feeling the urge. So I would fear the urge. I would fear it. I would fear this battle. I would fear. I just wanted the urge to watch, the urge to act on sexual sin and all different stuff. I wanted the urge to go away. And I would pray, God, let this go away. Let this go away. Let's go. Away. And I thought that that was the answer. Um, and I was, you know, like I said, I was scared. And it occurred to me that, you know, this, if I had a choice on whether I wanted to deal with struggling with sexual sin or not, I would choose not to. Right. But the problem is we don't have a choice. And that's not how it works. Um, this is a battle that we did not ask for. This is a war that we did not ask for, but that war has been brought to our doorstep. Almost every last one of us. Um, and it's standing at our doorstep. It's knocking on our door and we can't just ignore it. We can't just pray for it to go away. It has to be addressed. It has to be engaged with. I want us to understand that. This is not something that's just going to go away in the years to come. No, there are people in their 70s, probably still, maybe not 70s, because you know, erectile dysfunction, but like, you know, people in their 40s and they're in their 50s that are still dealing with lust, still dealing with pornography, masturbation, still dealing with sexual sin in one way or another. This is not a battle that just goes away. This is a battle that you have to engage. I had a turning point in my life um, when... I've had so many conversations. I've had so many deep conversations throughout the years, throughout my struggle. Um, but for whatever reason, this was a turning point when my mentor in Christ, um, I reached out to him. I, I had just fallen in sexual sin and I felt su super bad about it. And I reached out to him like, dude, I'm ready for a change. I do not want this anymore. I do not want this anymore. Um, and 
he just sent me back simple text. He said, submission of the flesh. It's about submission of the flesh. Um, start fasting. That's that's what he told me. Um, that wasn't a very like ta-da, like big turning point that I would have thought I would have had in my life to make me stop. But that hit, you know what I'm saying? Because it made things clear to me, maybe because I was more like mature in my relationship with God at this point. So things just became more clear to me when he said that. But he talked about subjection of the flesh, subjection of the flesh, subjection of the flesh. You know, what's interesting to me is that when it comes to the sexual sin stuff, you have to acknowledge that the devil is not your only only enemy. The devil and his demons are not your only enemy. It's not just you fighting demons in this and fighting evil spirits away. The devil is not your only enemy because you know who else is your enemy? Yourself. You are your enemy also. You know why? Because you have this. Because you have flesh. And in Galatians chapter 5 verse 17, it says, For the flesh lusts against the spirit. And the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. So that you do not you, you do not do the things that you wish. Ladies and gentlemen, I need you to understand this. This is not just about the devil. It's not just about his demons when it comes to the sexual sin stuff. It is about you. Because you have this flesh. And the Holy Spirit that is within you combats against this flesh. It wants the contrary. It's contrary to each other like we just read. It's contrary to each other. So that means that what you can do is starve the flesh and feed the spirit. You have to make the spirit stronger, the spirit in you, your connection to the Holy Spirit stronger than your connection to your own flesh. Starve the flesh, feed the spirit. How do I, how do, I do that, Emmanuel? Let's go. For me, um, like he said right, right away, he said start fasting. Like I've been fasting before, but I've never really, at the point I've never really fasted about sexual sin, which is crazy. Which is crazy. Um, maybe I would fast for forgiveness from sexual sin, but I wouldn't fast, you know, for the subjection of the flesh in a matter of sexual sin. But I started doing that. Um, this was me subjecting the flesh. I would pray. You know, I'd wake up in the morning. I'd pray. I'd read my Bible. I would journal. That's my. That's what I call my devotion. And then I would. I wouldn't eat till six p.m. And then at some point, I'd do another devotion during the day. And then I'd do a devotion at six p.m. And I break my fast then. Um, I would meditate meditation 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 on his word day and night i would meditate on his word i'd meditate on the different things that i was you know thinking what was my thought process while i was in the urge and i was going through the cycles um and then i do some practical things like you know you see on your phone if you have an iphone i don't know if you have this on any other phones but there's something called downtime where you can set you know certain limits on how long you're on your phone or you can you know say that i can't be on my phone or can't use certain apps at a certain amount of time in the day 10 p.m. to 10 a.m. I couldn't be on my phone. At least I couldn't be on any social media because we know that explore page. You know, we we know what's on there. We know we know the temptation that comes on Twitter out of nowhere. And you may not have asked for, but it's there. Um, so it was definitely some practical things, even like I would practice self-discipline in other contexts, like working out and eating healthy, because it was all about subjection of the flesh. I wasn't going to do what my flesh wanted. I'm not, I wasn't going to eat everything that my flesh wanted. I wasn't going to be lazy like my flesh wanted. I had to have that willpower. It's funny because willpower is exercise in every little thing that you do in life. You know, it could be, okay, I'm not going to eat that snack. Okay. I have to get up at this amount at this certain time. Okay. I have to, um, work out even when I don't want to. That's that willpower. And it's a great exercise to exercise uh, self-control. Um, but albeit all of these tax tactics were implemented in my life so I can subject the flesh, starve the flesh and feed the spirit. And as I'm doing this, you know, you'll notice. And as you're doing this, by God's grace, I hope that you feel convicted to do this. The Holy Spirit becomes easier to commune with you and 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 you can navigate through life and and you can you can understand what the spirit is communicating to you and the spirit is walking you through at least for me the spirit began to break things down for me one of the most pivotal things that the spirit did for me was start to uncover the lies and the tactics of the enemy the lies the the, the complexities in the urge and he started to tell me, yo, there are certain tactics that the enemy is using against you. And we're going to break them down. We're going to unpack them. We're going to unlearn things. And we're going to relearn things. 
I'm going to go to Proverbs chapter 7. If you are familiar with this battle, then I'm sure that you've read Proverbs chapter 7. But we're going to break um, some things down from there. Proverbs chapter 7, I'm going to start at verse... Um, what verse should I start at? I'm going to start at verse 13. Um so what's happening is the psalmist is sees this young man walking down the same street as a harlot. Um, and basically the harlot convinces the young man to have sex with her. And I want you, as I read this, I want you to realize that this harlot is not just symbolizing a prostitute, but it's also symbolizing any form of lust that you are combating right now. And that man is not just a man, it could be man or a woman. Like I want you guys to understand is I want you guys to put yourself in the position of this passage. It says, so she caught him and kissed him. With an, with an impudent face, she said to him, I have peace offerings with me. Today I have paid my vows, so I came to meet you diligently to seek your face, and I have found you. I have spread my bed with tapestry, colored coverings with of Egyptian linen. Look at that, the fantasy, the pain of the imagination. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, alloys, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love Excuse me. until morning. Let us delight ourselves with love, for my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He has taken a bag of money with him and will come home on the appointed day. Mm, so nothing bad will happen, right? With her enticing speech, she caused him to yield. With her flattering lips, she seduced him. Immediately, he went after her as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks till an arrow struck his liver as a bird hastens to the snare. He did not know it would cost his life. Now, therefore, listen to me, my children. Pay attention to the words of my mouth. This is the psalmist speaking now. Do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray with her into her paths, for she has cast down many wounded, and all who were slain by her were strong men. Her house is the way to hell, descending to the chambers of death. Mm. May God bless you, hearing and reading, standing of his word. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Her house is the way to hell, descending to the chambers of death lust sexual sin descends to hell down to the chambers of death it says so what was the first tactic that the enemy was using against me that the holy spirit revealed to me the first tactic was that the enemy needed to get me to believe that my fall was inevitable that i was at the mercy of the cycle ultimately it tried to convince me and it did convince me for a very long time that I had no control. Mm. <sighs> and if you, you know, you remember what I said before, that's why I was fearing the urge. I feared the urge because for me, the urge meant, oh, I'm going into this cycle. I had lost to the urge. I had lost that battle so many times that the enemy even made me made me convinced that the only way that I can win is if I don't feel the urge at all. That when that urge comes, there's no use in fighting it. You just have to go. You just have to go. I would fear the urge because I was convinced that I had no control. But then when we look at verse 21 and 22 of the passage that we just read, it says, with her enticing speech, she caused him to yield. Caused him to yield. With her flattering lips, she seduced him. Immediately, he went after her as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks. Look at this. She caused him to yield. He went after her. Sure, she seduced him. Sure, she convinced him. Sure, she persuaded him. But at the end of the day, there must be an action. Ladies and gentlemen, there must be an action. You can feel the urge to watch. You can feel the urge to do something when it comes to sexual sin. But you have to understand that you have control because at some point you have to give in. At some point you have to take the action, whether it's pulling something up on your phone, whether it's driving to the person's house, whether it's going to the bathroom to have privacy. At some point, one foot goes over the other. At some point, you you reach with your hand to your phone and that is your action and that is where your control lies, ladies and gentlemen. We have to. We have to admit the fact that we have control. We have to understand the fact that we have control because let me tell you something. If you don't admit and accept the fact that you have control, then the enemy will have control. Imagine there's a control room in your head, 
right? You have to assume the position as captain. And if you leave your post, the enemy will come in and assume that position for you. We have control. Therefore, we have accountability. Therefore, that is why it's a sin. The action. The action, ladies and gentlemen. And you may not want to admit that you have control because maybe, you know, if you admit that you have control, then you also have to admit that you're such a bad person. You're going to feel super bad about yourself. But don't. we're going to come back to that. We're going to come back to that. So please keep watching. Keep listening. Tactic number two that the enemy used against me. The enemy had to get me to believe that there were no consequences to my action. And let me tell you this. When I realized the true consequences of sexual sin, um, I think that has been one of the most persuading factors for me to, um, that has helped me to have self-control and to help me to stop. Um, which is so funny because I can see this in the scripture in verse 23 and 24. Um, I'm sorry, 22 and 23. It says immediately he went after her. I'm sorry. Ooh, that's the wrong place. Okay, I got you. <laughs> I wrote down the long one. Okay, yeah, it is uh, 23 and 24. Till an arrow. Oh, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. It's it's 22 also. Immediately he went after as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction to the stocks till an arrow struck his liver. As a bird hastens to the snare, he did not know it would cost his life. I was right, 22 and 23. That last part, though. He did not know that it would cost his life. Mm. Same way I didn't know what it could cost me. Same way you may not be privy to how deep this really goes. Because you might think to yourself, well, I'm just doing it to myself. Well, it's consensual and so on and so on. Who is it really hurting? <laughs> um, let me just tell you this. You don't have to know how your destruction will come, how the death will come. Um, for you to know it'll come because the scripture says it'll come. Um, you may not think that there's a cost, but let me tell you from years and years of experience that not only is there a cost, the cost is too expensive and you do not want to pay it. Remember that it said that her house leads to hell, descending to the chambers of death. You know, for a long time, I didn't understand what that meant. I didn't understand how lust and how sexual sin can lead to death. Until um, I had my own experience where it was a night that I fell into sexual sin. Then I went to sleep and then I woke up the next morning. And when I tell you I did for the first time in my life, Emmanuel Heke, the one that is preaching into this mic to you, right? For the first time in my life, I did not want to talk to God. I, I, I did not want to talk to God. I knew who God was, at least enough. I, I was saved, all that stuff. I did not want to talk to God. I was so guilty. I felt so dirty. I felt so wretched. I'm like, man, I do not want to talk to God at all, at all. And in that moment, thank God, it clicked to me. I want to separate myself from God. I want to separate myself from what he's been using me to do, separate myself from who he's created me to be. That is death. That is death right there. Now, I wasn't completely dead because I came back to God and I wasn't fully separated from God, but full separation from God is, in fact, death. Full separation from God. The one that created you, that created your identity, that gave you your purpose. Do you understand that when, the day that I woke up and I didn't want to talk to God, I, I wanted to reject the fact that I was who he said I was, called to, to, to preach and to call to do unassociated. This is the early, uh, early stages of unassociated. And hey, if, if you don't like it, you don't want to listen to me on, anymore because you found that out. Hey, I understand. It is what it is. God is delivering me now. Thank God. Um, but that moment, I will never forget that moment. It wasn't the last moment, but that moment, it changed everything for me because I finally understood the death and understood that this sexual sin 
jeopardized my relationship with God, jeopardized my identity and jeopardized my purpose because I no longer wanted part with these things because of the guilt that I felt. And at that moment, I realized that guilt is nothing to underestimate. Be very careful. Be very. I don't care how much faith that you think you have, how many mission missionary trips that you've had, how many years that you've been a Christian. That guilt is stronger than you. It is stronger than you. You will think that you're in great standing with God and then you fall and that guilt will take you ooh, for a roller coaster, man. Do not underestimate it. That guilt will be literally holding your hand to your own death. And you might say, oh, well, you know, what if you do it and you're not guilty? You do it and you're not guilty. Well, then that's normalization. And let me tell you something about normalization. When you create a lifestyle where you are in service to sexual sin. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 6 that you cannot serve more than two masters. You have to love one and hate the other. And it wasn't only talking about money, ladies and gentlemen. You have to love one. You have to hate the other. So there are two routes to death. Either guilt to death or normalization to death. And the thing is, once you realize that, then you also realize that there is zero room for compromise with sexual sin. Zero room for compromise. Whether you do it and you feel terrible about it, that guilt can kill you. Whether you do it and you don't feel terrible about it, that normalization can kill you. Because remember, there's a difference between guilt and conviction. I've talked about that before. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, um, this is only half of it. You know, I can, there's many different places we could talk about sexual sin, many different topics that we could bring up. But the point of me doing this episode was to sh to help you understand that it is possible. It comes with the subjection of the flesh, the feeding of the spirit. And as you're doing that, as you're in that process, some things being practical and then other things, mainly prayer, fasting and meditation and even journaling. The Holy Spirit can communicate things to you. You can recognize that you have control. You can recognize that there are consequences and you don't want to pay for that. It's too expensive. But let me leave with, you, with, you, with an encouraging word because it's many of you who feel so terrible. Maybe after this episode, you feel even more terrible about the things that you've done in the past. Um, let me tell you something. There is nothing that you can do. Relatively, almost nothing that you can do. There's one sin that's unforgivable. But beyond that, that the blood of Jesus Christ cannot wash away. Um. I want you to know that God knew that you was trouble with what you're struggling with. And it's the same thing that my big my big mentor brother really told me that God knew that you would struggle with what you're struggling with. Um and he still chose you. He still loves you. He chose you for a purpose. He gave you an identity. And let that be a symbol of hope for you. That with God, all things are possible. That God didn't choose me so I could remain in this position. No, that means I'm capable. I'm capable of being free. I'm capable of doing things for his kingdom. I'm capable. Because you are. And does that mean well, God loves me and I have his grace so I can do whatever I want to do? Like I said, that guilt to death, that normalization to death. You can beat it. If nobody, if nobody has told you that before, I want you to know, and I'm standing here as a testament to what to this statement, you can overcome sexual sin. It doesn't have to be something that you struggle with. It's true. Let's go into prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, God, for this time, Lord Jesus. Thank you so much, God, for these words, Lord Jesus. And I pray that it truly pierces the hearts of your children, oh God, and that it really fills them up, Lord. Take glory, honor, and praise in their lives, O oh God. Strengthen them, Lord Jesus. Let that cycle be broken in the mighty name of Jesus, Father God. Help them to, to starve the flesh and feed the spirit. And let your name, let your name be glorified, O oh God. Let your name be glorified, O oh God. Take all the glory. Help them to know that they can't do it by themselves, O oh God. They need the spirit. They need you. They need the fruits of the spirit, which one of them is being self-control, O oh God. Help them, Lord Jesus, in this walk, O oh God. Help them, Lord Jesus, to put you first, Lord God. Help them to want to move away from sin because they realize that it comes between you, a relationship with you, their own identity, their own purpose, oh God, that you've given them. Father, 
take glory, take honor, take praise in our lives, Lord Jesus, and help us. We are your vessels, nothing more, nothing less. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I pray. I love you guys. Have an amazing, amazing, amazing week. Merry Christmas. I didn't even talk about Christmas. I got my sweater on. Merry Christmas. I love you guys. <laughs> Peace. Thank <laughs> you.